thank you first of all raka for you know taking time off i know and uh, for you know people who have heard the initial bit of the conversation raka has been extremely busy trying to figure things out it's a crazy time for all of us in you know this education sector but definitely for raka who's the dean for social sciences as you, at university of california berkeley so first of all i really appreciate you taking this time and being with us today thank you thanks also to rupa and i'll introduce both of them very short shortly and very briefly but uh, let me just nevertheless at the very beginning also again thank rupa again another person who has been extremely busy and i have first hand knowledge of that so i really appreciate you taking this time off and you know being part of this conversation today really a um, pleasure also thank to all of you who have joined today I know people from across the world. All, all of you are eager to hear what Rupa and Raka has to say about education. Most of us, and I think that goes for most of the participants, are in some ways involved in this sector. It's to a large extent. It's not only about livelihoods for us, but it's also our lives. So you know, the, we are constantly thinking about okay what the impact will be how things will change and in particular you know will the new normal that will emerge will be more equitable more accessible or will it be in a different form shape uh, so this those are some of the questions that we do not know we can only guess at this point but we have raka with us who is you know i'm um, probably one of the most eminent persons to talk about that uh, let me introduce uh, uh, raka to you a bit as i already mentioned she is right now the dean for the division of social sciences at university of california berkeley however she is probably much much more well known as a sociologist and uh, she, her interests are in gender and feminist theory post colonial sociology and the emerging middle class she has extensively worked on india uh, so um, so she studies constantly tries to studies how gender has uh, you know evolved and uh, over the years she has written several books uh, starting from the fields of protest which uh, talk talks about the women's movements in two cities in kolkata and mumbai and uh, several others which are all very very uh, highly regarded right now she is working on a project on gender class and neoliberalism and uh, the sites where she is working on include mumbai allahabad and siliguri where she investigates the new meanings of middle classness gender and mobility against a neoliberal economy and the uh, valorization of the culture of aspiration uh, so so in some ways you know both these hats that she has as a, as a sociologist who has studied um, uh, continuous evolving middle class and gender and uh, as the dean of social sciences uh, we would be very keen and eager to see what she has to talk about uh but before she, she speaks today we have again we are very fortunate to have our own vice chancellor vice chancellor of shivnadu university professor ruba manjuri ghosh and uh, again uh, she, probably to many of here we, she needs no introduction but nevertheless let me just speak very briefly about her uh she i'll say what she has done to shivnadu university how she has been instrumental in building the university but before that she was also an eminent physicist with um, we keep joking her uh, joking with her about quantum things so she has been working on quantum optics and you know she has got got this ability to be at different places at the same time <laughs> i think from that research <laughs> and at many things at the same time so she she has initially joined at shivnadu university from jawaharlal nehru university as uh, the director for natural sciences and she has built up that school which all can agree is a really 
nice uh, and you know world class school that has uh, emerged as uh from then on she has done variety of things and probably you know all aspects of snu has been touched by her in one way or the other and eventually she has taken over as the vice chancellor for shivnath university and she's spearheading um, shivnath university's growth to and we really hope that it will happen very soon to become among the top universities in the world not only in india but among the world uh, you know world's best universities so today uh, she will, she is the one who will start and give us a very brief introduction to probably a little bit about shivnath university and about this whole crisis in education and then rakar will take over from there okay thanks and rupa thank you, you know, so much you know uh, <clears throat> patu of course heads our economics department you know he's credited with building uh, an extraordinary department but then of late he is spearheading our international partnerships and he's the dean of international partnerships and uh, anaka i'm really really pleased to share this platform with you and this is all thanks to patu without much ado because i i'm actually eager to hear professor ray and so uh, I, what i'll do is uh, maybe show you a few slides which i was just putting together just now <clears throat> and uh, talk about the journey you know the, the, this is a little contrasting if you look at it shivnagar university is only eight and a half year old but i'm really delighted to discuss this uh, the apparent contradictions and maybe the change that you see uh, in my mind are kind of uh, similar it's two faces of the same same story and this crisis that everybody is referring to covid 19 is a good crisis you know i was joking with my colleagues the other way they they never miss a good crisis for me it's a good crisis because there are a lot of learnings from this crisis and i'll be sharing our view point a bit so the advantage is in you has been that we are uh, young so uh, you know many things we had the the luxury of going through and debating and uh, coming up with a curriculum and a mode of delivery of the curriculum the vision and mission which i'll talk about and uh, you know covid actually has not changed any of that what it has done probably is try to accelerate our path a bit whatever we thought we would be doing the next two years we are doing it this month and so and so forth so uh, the 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 large scale operations at uh, berkeley and your experiences and uh the the legacy you have we have none of that but we are a university in the making and i think that contrast we'll sort of take a look at that our financial models are different uh, but our approach is different and i think i'll harp on this point about collaboration and solidarity which this crisis probably has taught all of us and collaboration happens only uh, based on complementary strengths not on weaknesses so a uh, young university like ours Uh, where our strong points are, where we wish to be, and how we can actually partner with similar thinking people, similar philosophy, and based on mutual strengths, and that something should be uh, is uh, what I want to talk about. So I'll uh, take your uh, uh, time to just share my screen if I could get it up. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. <clears throat> okay it's actually not uh, very important but you know raka i wanted you and uh, my viewers to see the campus that i've been missing so much this is the night view of the entry to the campus it has changed a bit it's a little old a photo i found in my computer so i thought i'll start with that so uh, we have a lavish campus uh, the beautiful lake inside where a lot of research is also going on on that wetland and so on and so forth but you know it's really really a beautiful campus and we'll be looking forward to welcoming you and all our viewers to this campus so what exactly are we trying to do it's a beautiful campus with beautiful buildings but <clears throat> i keep saying that what we do in those buildings is more beautiful than the buildings and i use this quote uh, shivnada university is a collective dream of many including me this is a quote by our founder uh, is the hcl founder mr shivnada and uh, this picture is a real picture again i'm trying to show you some glimpses this is our library building that you see in the front behind are our student hostels so it was designed to be a completely residential 
24-7 campus and a lot of learning outside the class. And I'm just going to touch upon that. So this collective dream, you know, it's, uh, it's all of us. It's like a mission you heard part of and we have several such people. This is not our job in there. There's a mission to create a model that maybe is a little different from what you see in the country. So how are we coping with the current crisis? So when we started, <coughs> there are three things that I love to describe our university by. It would be very uh, similar, you know, to the Bartley philosophy. But, you know, because we are new, as we are established only in 2011, but it was known to be a very long-term initiative. We are not looking for results tomorrow or the day after. We are looking at maybe 100 years right now. You know, <laughs> uh, so there are some initiatives that are long-term. There are some that we are also very, very agile. <clears throat> that has come in very handy. So we are a completely comprehensive university. We are not an IIT for technology. We are not an ISA for science. We are not an IIM for management. But all of that under an integrated umbrella. And I like to describe it as integrated STEAM curriculum. So STEM, which is, uh, you know, everybody knows it's a strange acronym, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. You add art and design notionally, <clears throat> but essentially it's this comprehensive curriculum. That's what Shibdana University's mission has been. And this has come in handy because I believe this is the future of liberal arts education. Liberal arts is never about arts. You know, it includes science and mathematics. And uh, like <clears throat> STEM, uh, you know, fostered innovation in the last century, this century would belong to STEAM subjects. And I think this is what we have been trying to do at SNU. So this multidisciplinarity allowed us to <clears throat> the luxury of doing interdisciplinary work, uh, the, the rich uh, knowledge that sometimes exists at the boundary of two disciplines. Our interdisciplinarity is not at the cost of disciplinarity. So I think this is what we started with. We have been highly research and innovation focused. So even undergraduate students are involved in research. So our teaching is research based, more exploration and innovation. COVID had changed the definition of that a bit. Uh, you know, the crisis that's going on with MSME in the country and so on and so forth. But the uh, idea was it's fun. It's also that's the true learning is all about. It's learning by doing. And COVID has even questioned our mode of delivery of that curriculum that learning by doing part, that doing hands-on training, what are we going to do about that? And the third that I used to describe our university by, that we are highly student-centric. That of course means it's very active learning. It's not passive lecturing, not radio mode, but they construct knowledge, but it was holistic. And a lot of it was outside the classroom and we are rethinking that part as well. There's a fourth dimension to SNU and that has to do with our context in as much as we are global in our outlook, we are strongly rooted in our context. And it, this multidisciplinary way of doing things allowed us to handle, uh, to make societal impact through science-driven policy making. For example, we do a water science and policy course, and there are many more such courses that are very, very needed. But because scientists can rub shoulders with social scientists, it's possible at SNU to actually come up with these innovative programs. And we are actually on course on that. So several issues already I have flagged. And uh, what has not changed again is the way we do things. I mentioned this for us, uh, liberal arts basically means liberal studies. And liberal basically means without boundary. It's a free study, not in silos. And this, this quote of Einstein, you know, Bartos said, I'm a physicist. I have to remember Einstein every now and then. And this is a very famous quote that is valid even till today, that the value of an education is not the learning of many facts, which you get now on the internet. This is 1921, mind you. But the value of education is the training of the mind to think something that cannot be learned from textbooks. And this Einstein was saying when Thomas Edison opined that a college education is useless. This reminded me of my generation. We are in spite of the system, not because of the system so much, and I did not have a Shivnara University to go to. So my students hopefully will make use of that. So the entire thing was related to our uh, conscious effort to, uh, to the debate of future of work. This, uh, you know, this panic uh, that people have of uh, machines taking away uh, livelihoods, not just the rote jobs, but thinking jobs because of AI. And in a country like 
uh, hours, we cannot really not link education at whatever level to livelihood issues. So, and this would, this you know better than me, but I think this overall has been uh, the framework of what we have been trying to do. The government of India had many schemes that they have come up with. I strongly believe that you cannot actually have a Skill India or a Startup India scheme outside the higher education system, because then you skill them on uh, something that become out of fashion tomorrow. So they would actually be uh, skillless uh, tomorrow if you take them out of the, uh, the, uh, the higher education system. So this has been more or less SNU's uh, advantage and that has worked for us. For us, creativity, design and innovation, they have sort of come together. We strongly believe in promoting project-based learning. This has taken a hit and this is where I think we can do some brainstorming and we have some idea about it. Uh, to, 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 to what I loosely say, to tap into the potential of connecting the left brain to the right brain the verbal, analytical, and orderly part to the visual and intuitive part. The orderly part, of course, the computers, uh, you can lose your job to an algorithm because this has been all coded. But the visual and intuitive part, uh, the computer has a, you know, a long time to get to the coding of that. So there's some kind of project-based learning that connects these two parts leads to real creativity. And so design and innovation has been part of our, uh, of our curriculum in that way. So what are the challenges, you know, I'll end here and I'll like to hear. It has been an optimistic way of handling things. You know, everybody's talking about the VUCA world. I talk about the VUCA response. So VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I would say, it's, uh, you know, our response is vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. And uh, with that response, we have managed. We are the, one of the first universities to start online classes on 16th of March. The week before was our spring break and uh, remarkable faculty, remarkable students and remarkable staff that we could actually do that on dot according to our regular class schedule and shifted everything online. So um, what is understood after these two and a half months of uh, continuous uh, survey feedback and improvement is that going by the scene, this is not a one-off uh, crisis, uh, it looks very clear that hybrid or the blended model is here to stay. So both in the content and the delivery, the content part, we probably had a futuristic outlook already. The delivery part, we are uh, still trying to perfect and we have a lot to learn from your experiences. So it, it, ideally it should be a very personalized digital learning and it has to be supplemented by hands-on experience in labs and studios. Uh, students are dying uh, to return to the campus. They don't pay fees for, uh, you know, for digital learning of the client we are delivering right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they, they, they're dying for the campus experience. And some of us old fashioned feel that uh, on campus socializing, learning with peers is really uh, an essential part of the university education. And as I said, you know, I would not take much time. 10 minutes is what I told Partho. And uh, the importance of collaboration, the importance of solidarity, the importance of sharing of ideas and complementarity, I cannot overemphasize that right now. And I think all of us are going through this, uh, these challenges. And in some way, SNU is a little ahead. You know, our semester is slightly delayed. We are more or less closing. Our next semester is going to start on time. And we are also looking at digital delivery of courses, for example, a business analytics course that we are talk, uh, you know, rolling out next month, our first such production from SNU with the quality content partner. And I think more such cases are going to come up, but this is the ideal time for experimentation to face these challenges in an optimistic way in the interest of our students. So I started by saying one of the main things was student-centric approach to everything that we do. And for us, the ultimate thing is the student experience. And by students, I am now including our alumni because today's students really never graduate. They stay lifelong learners because skills you need to update continuously. And those lifelong learners <laughs> are going to be part of our, uh, in our focus. The economy is a little unstable. Partha knows about that and advising us about it. But then we need to be a little ahead to figure out if the economy is little down, this may be the ideal time for people to come back to the campus for upskilling. 
they would do that provided the value addition is very clear to them so i think we are a young very ambitious new age university which has been recognized by the government of india as an institution of eminence you know 10 private universities two are new brand new then they don't exist but of the eight existing uh, private universities that have been uh, given this tag of institution of eminence we are the youngest so a lot of ambition there and i think we are looking forward to partnership and wisdom and complementary expertise from uh, you know from people like you and uc bartley to take this forward so i'll stop here and i'll be very happy to answer questions later part of thank you thank you rubal <laughs> thanks so much for that and uh, raka if you can just take over from there okay um Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupa Manjuri Ghosh and Dr. Parth Chatterjee. I'm so pleased to be able to participate in this webinar with my colleagues at Shivnadar University today. And uh, I want to thank also those in India for being willing to listen to a talk so late in the evening. Um, I'm going to sort of formally read out my comments, uh, and then we will uh, have a discussion. As I contemplated what I should speak about. the topic quite naturally suggested itself to me as a new dean this spring i was thrown head first into the somewhat frantic business of ensuring that our faculty students and staff stayed safe and healthy while making sure that the educational enterprise continued and this is the same of course in shivnadar soon after the first month or so when it became clear that the corona virus was not done wreaking its havoc we pivoted towards planning for the future but along with each step we took it was clear to me that the timing of the covid-19 crisis at a moment of profound challenges to the structure of the university itself meant that we had to think hard about what was happening and about what was to come so i want to start with a brief reflection on higher education itself and i'm going to do that based on the public education system in the us by this i mean the state funded education but i'll also include observations about the overall trajectory of higher education and i think that what i'm going to have to say would be quite relevant to many countries in the world today beyond the us though of course the details may be particular to the us and i already see some parallels with the experience of snu now we know that the national origins of universities lie to different degrees in the twin requirements of the economy and nation building in other words the purpose of universities was to create knowledge required both for a modern economy and for a modern citizenry these two functions of universities did not always dwell easily with each other public universities in the us for example inhabit an uneasy zone between democracy as the popular expression of the national collective and the private structure of the economy in part universities also provide legitimation for a hierarchical system So Raven Connell, author of a recent book um, called *The Good University*, uh, based in Australia, is spot on when she writes: "Once upon a time, bishops and kings provided their societies with an ideology of hierarchy. Now the university system does." In the U.S., even as public universities, especially the elite public universities, are complicit in the reproduction of inequalities through their increasingly unaffordable tuition. their admission systems and their styles of teaching and assessment they still represent the democratic ideology that undergirds american identity in other words while public universities do function squarely within the parameters of the private economy they also hold out the promise of equalization and more democratic access they hold out the promise of democracy and meritocracy the promise that you do not need to be rich only good enough to deserve the best education and through this education individuals will build not just their human capital but the realization of their capacities as human beings let me say a word about the changes uh, that i'm referring to i'll do so wearing my sociologist hat universities are embedded within their, within their societies and their economies they must eventually therefore behave as do other organizations in society for when for political theorist wendy brown this means that while in the 20th in the mid 20th century us universities were part of corporate welfare capitalism they are now being undone or redone by shareholder capitalism with the rise of the power of trustees 
the reliance on rankings, advisory boards, and metrics the university is being remade. Sociologist Michael Burovoy writes that the fiscal crisis is pushing the university into the hands of its clients, whether this be business and corporate donors on the one side or students on the other. Fiscal crises have indeed created a crisis of governance in the university. 30 years ago, the state supplied 50% of Berkeley's budget. For example, today, it supplies only 13. Enter the novel coronavirus. Just as the pandemic has exposed the fault lines of societies in which some are protected and most not, in which some who have permanent jobs take the opportunity to experiment with new meals and others have to walk thousands of miles home with all they own on their backs, so too has this pandemic exposed the new fault lines of higher education. There I was, a new dean of social sciences, beginning to think about the ways in which I could make more visible Berkeley's great contributions to the research on inequality and democracy and to make global partnerships when COVID arrived. First sneakily, and then like a cyclone that refused to move on. On March 6th, the University of Washington announced it was canceling in-person classes. By the middle of March, more than 100 universities and colleges followed suit. Athletic events were canceled, as were concerts and graduation. Overnight, universities had to make decisions about how they could keep teaching and research going while keeping everyone safe, and then they had to start making tough decisions about how they were going to keep themselves going financially as they observed the path of both the virus and the economy. Our students went home to two kinds of homes, which became visible to our faculty as they converted overnight to remote teaching through Zoom. Now, through Zoom, they could see the world their students came from. The worlds, rather. Some appeared at desks before original works of art or sat in the backyards of their beautiful homes, and yet others tried valiantly to focus on class while their families carried out their daily activities in the same room behind them, and the internet coverage went in and out. Hard-working, working-class students began to miss classes and assignments as they went out to find jobs or spent time navigating the bureaucracy required to be able to receive their unemployment checks. But these were the students who combined jobs and studying, often sending home to the money home to their families. I'll return to these students later, but let's turn to what the universities had to do and have to do. There are, I believe, 4,000 colleges and 20 million students in the United States. And every single one of these 4,000 colleges and universities is at the moment frantically working on how they can bring students back in the fall. Why? Because the revenue model of public universities depends on tuition and taxes, and that of the private universities relies on tuition and endowments. It's now clear that they're going to face massive revenue shortfalls. This means that they face hiring freezes and possibly personnel layoffs. Graduate students, what you call postgraduate students who have invested six to eight years in a PhD will have no teaching jobs to go to. The longer universities remain closed, the more financial trouble they'll be in. So Christina Paxton, who is the president of Brown University, wrote an impassioned article in the New York Times where she reminded readers of how important higher education is to the US economy. She says that the sector employs 3 million people and pumps billions, hundreds of billions of dollars into spending into the national gross domestic product. Our missions of education and research drive innovation, advance technology and support economic development, she wrote. The spread of education, including college and graduate education, enables upward mobility and is an essential contributor to the upward march of living standards in the United States and around the world. We must keep universities open. The remade university in the United States, at least, has a problem. Especially since the 1980s, higher education has morphed from a more or less affordable investment in the next generation to something which has become increasingly unaffordable to the majority of American families. Today, a college education is beyond the means of most Americans, unless they take out massive loans. Education is a highly competitive, increasingly bifurcated enterprise with the most elite universities representing a brand, what some have called a luxury good. 
universities fully engage in this branding exercise and at the same time have to view the student as a consumer to satisfy so they will give back to them as alumni in the future. These very expensive universities are themselves now struggling to survive because if students or rather their parents do not think it worth returning in the fall if education will still be remote, then there will be no revenue from tuition or room and board. Because why would a parent be willing to spend $50,000 on tuition if their child cannot even be on campus? And uh, Rupa Manjuri Ghosh, I think, referred to the same thing. In the US, without big football games, there will be no revenue from athletics. With a decline in the market, fewer private donors may step forward. What will that mean for the financial model for universities? The first colleges and universities that announced that they would be open for in-person teaching in the fall were the second and third tier private colleges, which simply will not be able to sustain themselves without tuition revenue. A Silicon Valley um, entrepreneur who teaches at the uh, NYU Business School, Scott Galloway predicts that many colleges will simply disappear, but not all. There will be, he writes, a dip amongst the top 50 universities where the revenues are hit in the short run and then technology will expand their enrollments and they will come back stronger. In 10 years, it's feasible to think that MIT doesn't welcome 1,000 freshmen to campus, it welcomes 10,000. What that means, and this is the point I really want to make from this extensive quote, what this means is the top 20 universities globally are going to become even stronger. What it also means is that universities number 20 to, 20 to 50 are fine, but numbers 50 to 1000 go out of business or become a shadow of themselves. The more elite the university, the more chance it has to survive because there are people who will after, want, after all want that name, the brand, Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, Cambridge. These elite universities too will dip into their wait lists this year to meet their admissions target. But the lower down you go, the less likely it is that you will have wait lists and the harder it is for you to get enough students to survive. So who will survive and what will survive? As to the who, elite universities will survive, but the lower level state universities will also survive, though they will provide an even more resource poor education than they already do thus hollowing out the middle and widening the gulf. There is more. Scott Galloway writes, the post-pandemic future will entail partnerships between the largest tech companies in the world and elite universities. MIT at Google, I Stanford, Harvard at Facebook. According to Galloway, these partnerships will allow universities to expand enrollment dramatically by offering hybrid online offline degrees the affordability and value of which will seismically alter the landscape of higher education. What will survive? And this is what I wanted to focus the last few minutes of my talk on. What will survive, I fear, is a diminished idea of education, a version of education that is purely online, a version that knows no difference between a credential and an education, a version that was already a possibility before COVID-19. Now, what happens in the physical space of a university? Students not only learn from the text and from the professor, they learn in talking to each other, in the cafe, in the dorm rooms, as they debate and argue and learn how to articulate and defend their ideas. They learn how people who come from backgrounds vastly different from their own think. University students, often away from home for the first time, make mistakes, stumble find their feet, find friends who will be their allies and their networks for life. They learn passion and reason. They fall in love. They get their hearts broken. They get their minds blown and they come into their own. They get an education. For students from underprivileged, back social, uh, underprivileged backgrounds, the physical space of the university is even more vital. If public education is a major engine for social mobility, it is an engine that plucks these students out of impoverished homes and environments and throws them into an environment where they can begin to imagine an alternative world for themselves, where they have a room to study in peace. For them, going away to school means far, far more than getting a credential. It means 
a whole new world of possibility. The sense of belonging to another world is absolutely critical for their ability to imagine and forge a new life, an upwardly mobile life. As we hear from these students who have now had to go home, they have been wrenched away from these new spaces of flourishing. They struggle to keep up with their online work as they share the one computer at home with their siblings and work delivery jobs. They must return to their household responsibilities, their financial responsibilities, fitting in online courses when they can. But online classes were never really intended to provide an education. They provide an individualized learning experience, which leads to the desired credential. But education is supposed to be about more than a credential. But it has over the last 40 years or so become devalued and its meaning diminished. In gaining a credential and not an education, you will learn perhaps the skills needed for work, but not those required to understand and participate in the civic and political life of the world and the nation, the skills you need for a modern citizenry. Tech companies have been very active at this moment, actively promoting a no going back attitude, arguing that technical skills are more valuable for the workforce than a four year college degree. As universities begin to rely more and more on tech platforms to deliver remote and online education and assessment. We see that some large tech companies no longer require college degrees for some of their technical positions. Let me be very clear. There is no harm in equipping people with technical skills. Indeed, it is good and important to do so. But what form should such skill acquisition take? In terms of teaching, those of us who are teachers have been thrown into the world of online teaching. And both students and, and teachers have struggled with how to best teach and how to best learn. For those of us who love teaching, there is a structure to the performance of the lecture. The professor as an academic here know what I mean. You speak, you make an argument, you illustrate via example, and you pause to take the pulse of the room. And in that pause, you catch a student's eye and know that she has experienced that aha moment when things have clicked for her. And you go home knowing you have had a good teaching day. How do you do that when you, all you see are a few little squares of individual student faces on a screen? We have no choice at the present moment but to teach remotely. What we make of this time, however, what we make of this moment is a political and societal decision. Sure, we can get better at delivering courses online and that will strengthen the case for online courses. In that case, we might consider this. Why should college take four years anyway if we can all learn at our own individual pace? Some of us could speed through the online courses and thus compress the time it takes to get a degree. Why bother with four years? In addition, institutions might think, with online classes, we can add 20,000 more students by putting lectures online and not worry about having not enough space in our classroom. So let's build this model up. Let's follow the road on which the pandemic has set us. This could be the financial saving of higher education. We have a second choice, and that is to refuse, to resist, and to say that we will never teach remotely, we will never teach online, we will never allow what we do to be packaged and sold and potentially to replace us once the modules we have prepared are of high enough quality. That is indeed how many faculty members feel. But we have a third choice. We can use this moment to reinforce the best that education can be. In a provocative piece called Imagining the Post-Pandemic University, Jodi Green challenges us to rethink the way we teach. She says, let's not forget that the large lecture hall was not actually the best vehicle for teaching. These practices, the lecture, the timed examination, all came about in the 19th century with the productivity ethos and the rise of factories as did standardized tests and multiple choice examinations. Within weeks of the onset of the pandemic, she wrote, all of these familiar features of higher education as we know it have come under review, have been rethought, and in some cases been eliminated altogether. Who would have predicted or even allowed themselves to dream such a thing? Indeed, she is right. Because remote teaching makes the standardized test and timed examination, examination structure impractical. So faculty are coming up with all sorts of new creative, 
assessment tools and assignments, collective projects and the like. Most campuses are, as I said, and I come to my conclusion here, thinking about how to make universities safe for the students and faculty and staff when they return. They are worrying about how to ensure that they have a new cohort of students in the fall. The Center for Disease Control in the US has set guidelines about low, medium and high risk ways to manage classes and research in a university setting. And colleges and campuses are working on these issues every minute of every day. They are working to ensure that they have enough of a campus life so that, so that at least some students do in fact return to campus. They are focusing on the availability of testing, contact tracing, and the need to create social distancing, on how to replace elements of college life such as athletics and recitals and talks with safer, socially distanced, distanced or virtual versions. These are all good and necessary things. Like Paxson, I too strongly believe that universities should be open. I believe the world needs universities. But this is also a moment in which we can begin to draw on more student and learning center techniques of teaching, whether online or not. Look, I love to lecture, but we have known for years that that isn't the best way students learn. We have to think about how to engage students in the world and deploy different modes of student assessment, which take into account what we should want them to learn, how to think. There have been studies for years about alternative ways of teaching and assessment. It's time we took them seriously. Above all, we could, instead of relying on metrics that are so acutely subject to the rationality and form of the, of the private economy, and that diminish the meaning of what education does, decide to take the purpose of education seriously again. We are indeed in a shareholder economy where relationships between students and faculty, faculty and administration, and ideas of governance are being transformed. It is up to us though, to insist that a nation's and the world's long-term goals are best served when its universities are engaged, not just in the creation of workers, but in the creation of a thinking citizenry. A credentialing society based on online education cannot do that. In such a credentialing society, a population will learn, will not learn how to counter attacks on truth, facts, or science. For when the university does its job well, it teaches young people exactly what Rupamangiri Ghosh's uh, Einstein quote said. When a university does its job well, it teaches young people not what to think, but how to think. The COVID-19 crisis has given us this moment. It's up to us to either continue on the path down which it appears to be leading us, or to challenge and reimagine in partnership with each other the possibilities and the promise of higher education. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the discussion now. Thank you so much. That was very engrossing and, you know, obviously something that we are all been thinking about and you put it so nicely that the need for education on campuses. And uh, as he was talking, you know, at the very beginning, you mentioned that, and again, you came back to it towards the end. You mentioned that, you know, the role that education plays is not only about just credentialing, not only about preparing individuals for jobs, but in some sense, it also mediates between ver various forces. You mentioned, for example, democracy and you know, private ownership. Um, uh, and you kind of came back to that towards the end when you said that, um, that today, if the campuses are going to, you know, if people are not going to come back to campuses, then maybe that whole role will be shifted and may not be, may not even happen. So that's exactly what I was thinking that, do you think in an online mode, we will be able to carry on with a democratic structure with, and particularly thinking about an emerging country like India, right? Uh, where all kinds of, you know, forces often try to pull us apart. 
right? How do we kind of, and education I think plays a very important role in bringing all things together. So, so do you think if we move to a different form of teaching, primarily online, we will as educationists as teachers vacate that and you know how the society will shape up from then on i mean these are things that i don't have an answer to i think the to if you go completely online you have a bigger problem in india which is the problem of access you know this, most of the people won't be able to access education if education is done uh, purely online. So that's an issue that is a separate issue, uh, of course. Um, but we also have the same issue here where in some uh, rural areas, there's just you know, dead zones and, and people you know, simply can't have access uh, to, um, to online education. Um, so I want to say two somewhat contradictory things here, um, but I hope that they're not really fully contradictory. One is, I, I don't think, I obviously my preference is not to go fully online for the story, for the reasons I said. Education um, is done in a, it should, it's best done in an embodied way with people interacting and learning from each other. Um, it's the same uh, thing that I remember when I, I realized that I no longer went to the library um, I, I just would go for the book that I needed online. But the most important thing that, that I used to find when I went to the library, when I picked up a book, was the book next to it, right? And then you think, oh, I hadn't thought about this. What about this book? And you take out that book and the next book. That is what, once I went online, I never did it again because there was never that next book. I went online and I picked up that book that I needed. That kind of lateral learning that is done best in an embodied way disappears with online education. Having said that, I also want to say that online itself isn't the problem purely, right? So right now it's going this credentialized way because of the reasons I think it, 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 became, uh, it became popular and because of the certain efficiencies it, it creates. But I actually think that we as administrators, as, um, as people who want uh, that form of education uh, that we are talking about, that, that existed in the past, that want a more democratic um, creation of, of, of thinking citizenry, we should be able to seize control of the tools online and do a better job. We can create a sort of online, a, a democratic learning. We can create um, alternative forms of assessment that will stimulate people to not just be competitive with each other, but to work collaboratively and collectively to build the biggest project, uh, build the best product rather. So I think that um, I, I, A, I don't, I, I, I do not wish that we go purely online, I think it would be a disaster, but B, I think we should use some of those tools of online and instead of just being afraid of them, but use the things that it opens up to continue to, to deepen democracy. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we are flooded with questions and I'll read out some, uh, but okay. before that, uh, uh, you know, what you again alluded to and like the funding patterns of the universities in India, of course, now there's a new set of universities that have come up, including our Shivna University. Yeah. Rupa, Rupa has spent considerable amount of time in a public university at JNU, right? And uh, so Rupa, I was wondering in some ways that will this crisis, do you think will increase the gulf between these set of universities, those who, have, who are endowment rich to a certain extent versus those who are funded by the government. But uh, remember in India, by the way, uh, a largest spender in education is still the government, right? So, right. so yeah, uh, we are so, talking about it before your formal session started. The situation in India is a little different. You know, uh, we always had this huge problem of access, but more of quality. You know, uh, you know, uh, without quality, providing access to mediocre education was it, 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 India has gone through that already. So now is a new wave. So the government cannot wash off its hand. You know, it has to be publicly supported because you know, kind of problems we are facing right now. If you do not have connectivity at a student's home, it's not just yeah. the home situation. 
but just connectivity, forget Kashmir, but everywhere else, you cannot really deliver what we wish to deliver. So there's a lot of work that the government needs to do. I think necessarily it would stay. What this will do is a little bit of competition in quality, which is needed in India. You know, unlike other countries, India doesn't have any lack of students. Those students who are not going out of country are now homebound. So we have an opportunity in this country to scale up, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of quality and what the country needs. And that's where I think I was talking about it in, in very briefly. This is the priority of each university in this, because in online, certain things you can do very well, right? And uh, certain other things may be the necessity of your society and your country. That would need that, because, you know, I joke about it, you can't quite eat AI, right? You need physical systems, you need food, you need energy, you need all this work that is going on on COVID in the lab done by people, because, you know, it's, it really needs that. So I think that there is no online substitute for any of that right now, as we know education to be in. And India has a lot of opportunity. In, in expanding this and maintaining all that we have talked about. So I think public funding is necessary in India. I think uh, one part that Raka mentioned, and I completely agree that uh, these partnerships that I talked about earlier, I don't mean just industry academia partnership or national international partnerships. I'm talking about private public partnerships as well. And in that, the point she made, and I completely agree, the driver of these partnerships and the quality controller of these partnerships essentially have to be universities. I don't see any other player be able to do this quality control that we need to have that visioning that we talked about. Universities are needed for me more for that purpose as, as the driver of this ecosystem, as a quality controller of this ecosystem and actually setting the horizon for that. Where it will have problem is again going back to part of your question is then more and more the financial model of such a sociological university that would become a very complex because you know fee paying students managing your finances that's all sort of understood but this model where you would be actually driving a system for the society that model of the financial model of universities needs to be thought through and this has to be a government and, uh, and private public uh, endeavor all over the world and i think what India has a, a bit of a different situation right now, but we'll catch up in, in this mode, we'll catch up in the next couple of years. And I think it, this is the time we should be thinking about the financial model, how to sustain what we think in our wisdom is the way to go, how to actually support and generate finance, because this is the future of the world as we know it today. If I might just add to that, that I think that um, the, it should be very clear that I think what we're all saying is that, yes, we clearly are entering a world where private public partnerships are, are, are important. And as, as, as um, Dr. Ghosh so uh, clearly put it, that, 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 and of course that I agree that, that university should be the driver of that relationship. But I also want to make a very strong plea that this is not the time for states to withdraw funding of, the, of, of education. Right. When a government withdraws funding of, of an education, it is fundamentally abdicating its duties. The, the government's duty is to educate its people and to, to, to equip them, um, to, to educate them all around with skills, with, with, with the, the ability to think. And if a government withdraws and, and, and uh, you know, just thinks that the private sector will do it, that would be that would be a disaster. Uh, Globally, no, absolutely, and in fact, I mean, uh, bec because of the structure of Indian population, it's even more true here. Because, as Rupa mentioned, we are flooded with uh, college-going yes. students. Right, uh, private sector is simply inadequate to handle that. So, right now, more than ever, I think the government has to step in and you know, yeah. create yeah. spaces and opportunities for them. Okay? Now, let me take a couple of questions. I know uh, it's late here in India and people are probably going to get tired very soon. So I'll keep it to one or two questions only. I know sure. there are a lot of questions. Maybe we'll email some of them later on and we'll figure out how to answer them. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. 
So there's one question which says that it seems that a privately funded higher education system will, it's kind of continuing with the uh, dialogues that we were having. Uh, uh, education system will be badly hit after COVID. Uh, then are you suggesting that a publicly funded higher education system will become even more critical in the post COVID world for many countries, particularly developing countries like India? Yes. I think it's, it's even more critical. Um, and I think it is, again, I think all of these are decisions. I think there's nothing inevitable about any of these things. These are all decisions that are made. So, you know, a government might decide, oh, we don't have money. Let's take the money away from education and invest in something else. So these are decisions governments make. And, the, and that would be a, a very, very bad idea. So yes, I think it would be even more critical. Um, I think uh, it is, yeah, I'm, I'll just stop there. I think it'll be even more critical, yes. Yeah, so there's another question, I think, which kind of relates Sorry, to... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to interrupt sure, myself. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's even more critical also, because if, if we get a bifurcation such as, so, so that the elite go to the private universities and the rest go to a badly funded, under-resourced public university, that would be, a, again, a, just a bifurcation and a continuation of uh, 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 the, the creation of, of, of the continuation of inequality. And that is really not what we, what we want. We want a well-resourced public education system as well as a well-resourced private education system. Right. Sorry. So, no, no. Uh, in fact, the next question is, again, kind of continues with that thought. It says that if the elite universities will prosper and it go, I think it you know, goes back to what Scott Galloway has men mentioned that you know, there will be only a few. So from an economist's point of view, the competition goes down and that's what the question relates to, I think. That won't it lead to even higher tuition fees, right? Because less people will be you know, kind of, the supply will be limited and less people will probably also go to college. So in some sense, it will be much more a cartel than uh, anything else. So how will that emerge? Where, where will the different scholarships come from and things like that, right? So, so we'll enter a world where, um, it, it's, it's again, my, the same answer as the last one, an increasingly bifurcated world where the good education is available only to those who can afford it, right? And the promise of public education is that if you're good enough, you will get in. That disappears, right? It's now it will be if you uh, are rich enough, you will get in. And you don't want that sort of system. Um, yes, of course, if once the tuition will increase, it will become a luxury product available only to a handful. Um, and, and yes, you can get, uh, you will have um, scholarships because. Um, always in, 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 in philanthropic education and in private education, there have always been scholarships. But that can never be enough, right? That will be a catering to the elite and a handful of the non-elite. That is, that, is, that is precisely the kind of situation we want to avoid. A hollowed out middle always is a bad signal. A hollowed out middle in terms of uh, the class structure um, is always a dangerous uh, and unwanted situation. So there's a question from Robin Marsh who says to Dr. Uh, Raka Ray again, uh, can you conceive of UC Berkeley engaging in hybrid joint degree programs with universities from the global south, part of an internationalization at home kind of a vision? I think that there are conversations about these things. I think that increasingly as um, the world becomes more and more globalized and the US is no longer necessarily the most powerful player in the world, it also will have an interest in um, reaching out to uh, uh, two global partners and to create uh, global forms of learning. I think at this point, uh, there are little pockets in which these are happening, little uh, you know, sort of niche sectors in which this is happening. Um, part of, of course, the conversation that we are beginning to have with Shivnadar University is to imagine at least some form of partnership 
um, where our students and our faculty can learn from each other. So um, let's see, uh, let's see where, uh, where it goes. I think that is the way the world is moving. Okay, I think uh, let's end with one more discussion and this is much more pragmatic discussion because a lot of questions about that, that how do you, you know, prepare the campus in some sense, uh, not only in terms of physical things like social distancing and all, but what other steps or what, what is it that you guys, both of you, uh, Professor Ghosh as well as Professor Ray, are doing so that, you know, the campus is prepared for the post-COVID world? or not, not even like a long-term thing, but a very short-term thing for the students to come back or, you know. The, Look, I'll be very honest. I'm very nervous about this. And I'm very nervous about this um, for almost a demographic reason. We can create social, some socially distanced classrooms. We can have masks and we can have sanitizer and we can say, okay, a classroom for 100 people, we can map it out and say, okay, 25 can sit in this classroom. But you cannot monitor what an 18 year old is doing outside of the classroom. You know, they will socialize, they will hang, you know, so in some sense, I do have an anxiety about bringing undergraduates back. Um, if, if we do it, it will be, you know, I think, uh, as I think uh, Dr. Ghosh said at the very beginning, this concept of a new normal, where, where not just modes of learning, but modes of sociability must be transformed. And that is going to take some trial and error and who will pay the price for those errors? So I am nervous about these things, even as though as we're planning for it, we all have to plan for it. I remain, and here I'm speaking for myself, not for my campus, I remain personally nervous. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dr. Ghosh? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, it is a little unnerving but I think uh, our size, Pakto, is, uh, is our advantage right now. You know, Raka, we are a very small scale. So 2,000 undergraduates, but 200 PhD students. And PhD students, we are increasing yes. the number of. And uh, some uh, 500 odd people are already on campus right now. That includes faculty families. And, you know, 50 uh, PhD students are using their research labs right now, as I speak. So 47 or so people are coming back. When they come back, we have a quarantine procedure now, 14 days, they are inside. So the campus, we actually, first thing we did, we closed the entry and exit. That's, so, that's uh, very important. It's a closed yes. campus. Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I, I think what we did is that those who were inside, we did, not, uh, we did not ask them to leave. Those who were outside, I asked them to stay out. That's the first uh, communication from me at the beginning of March that is, I sent out. So we made sure those who are inside the campus are safe. And we are monitoring. So we have a 14-day quarantine. If you go out, you come back, there is a quarantine space. You have to stay there. Food and everything is being served there. So uh, we have been doing it, and the small scale allowed us this exclusive treatment. We have now opened it up to PhD students who want to come back, and if their local conditions permit them to come back. So all of that we are doing. In terms of curriculum, though, what Patho, I think, was also asking, we are rethinking. We are thinking of courses uh, you know, the way in our wisdom, we started with heavy laboratory investment, uh, studio investments, a lot of experimentation everywhere uh, in the campus. And I think those are, uh, we are not willing to give it up. So we'll be doing it in a way. And, you know, Sukumar and others subject to social distancing. So I'll call it spatial distancing, you know, socially not distant, but spatially distant. Uh, and I think we, we will manage to make this plan. It would be a slow process. It would be a little slower than that. I don't think people should just sort of start jumping and expect things to come back to some normal. There is nothing called the normal. This is what it is today. And we'll actually go through this in a very careful manner and learn uh, along the way. And I think uh, we are kind of ready to, to start this process and uh, in, in uh, not lose out time the anxiety level of our students and their parents is quite high because, you know, given the economic situation, not just this year, next year, uh, everything we are talking about as a private player, particularly because of our founder, we've been very conscious of taking fees. If I'm taking fees, then in return, what do they get from us, right? So this is a very complex question. Some of the time I would love to have this 
adda with uh, patso and and aka to uh, to talk about all of that in a in a bigger context but right now that's what it is so this education not just a, a credential but the education at snu or education at bharti that's a bigger one well known but you know the branding of it when you increase your fees it goes with some kind of a concept of branding not just a commodity that you are marketing but the branding the branding comes from uh, the rest that we talked about not so tangible to very tangible things so in some way in my optimistic feeling i think there will be a balance you know you cannot go crazy on one because the other one will bring it down and there will be a balance that would bring in the quality and the sanity that we are all hoping for so uh, let's see how it pans out i'll be lying to you if i say part so that i really know what would happen in snu in august but uh, we have a plan and the best plan is we know how to make a new plan and uh, we have a plan a and a plan b and a plan c and we have been really really agile we are monitoring even faster than the government sometimes and we have been on our feet uh, all of us really uh, the, the faculty students and staff together and we have been at it and so uh, the plan is to handle it as and when it comes which perform it comes uh, we'll we'll handle it and that's the agility i'm looking for remember the vuka a i think that's absolutely right i i just wanted to say also that i have been amazed at the agility and the compassion i would say that that students faculty staff have all shown everybody is looking after each other everybody is looking out for each other you know older faculty who aren't used to zoom are being helped by younger you know everybody was helping everybody and that has been really a beautiful feeling of community and that has given me even though i don't know the answers who knows you're working all the time but that faith and that optimism actually comes from seeing how people have come together that's true okay thank you so much and with that optimism and that hope let's call it a well night here and a day for you you will still have a long day to go yes Now i will begin my day and you will end yours thank you yes. so much for this opportunity it, it's so, so nice to to hear you raka and thanks partho for uh, doing this so well and your team prashita and others thank you very much Absolutely. thank you raka thank you so i'm really hoping to uh, meet you at the campus pretty soon Well, I thought I would be coming back in March, and then I thought uh, July. And now I'm thinking December. So uh, we'll make it happen. We'll make it. We'll happen. make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Thank you so much, and thanks everyone for being with us. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>